The purpose of this video will be to explain how to use the IX81 or Luna microscope to acquire bright field images. So the first thing we need to do, um, because we're under COVID conditions, is to make sure we have the personal protective equipment that's required for this system. So that for this system includes a mask and gloves. So you can see mask and gloves. And then we have to perform some disinfection steps before and after using the system. So let me first remove the dust cover and I will point out the things that need disinfection. We are going to use pure ethanol on lens paper to wipe the eyepieces. This is pure ethanol, this is lens paper, and we need to use it to wipe these eyepieces. Then we're going to use 70% ethanol on a paper towel or Kim wipe to wipe the knobs, the joystick, the keyboard, and the mouse. So 70% ethanol, if it's not on this table, you'll find it in this room over here. So it's a little bit hard for me to wipe everything down uh, while I'm filming, so I'm gonna do that and then I'll uh, start the video back up again. Microscope has been disinfected, so let's go on to the startup procedures for this microscope when we are doing bright field illumination. So you'll see on this table, there's a sheet that has the shutdown instructions on one side and the startup instructions on the other. And what you'll notice is that the startup instructions have two sections for fluorescence imaging or for bright field imaging. If you come and you find the system on, you should still look over those instructions to make sure that the components that you need for the particular kind of imaging that you are doing are on because the previous person might have been doing fluorescence imaging and you need to do bright field or vice versa. So it's a good idea to go over these instructions even if the system seems like it is on. So right now the system is off, so we will go through the instructions for bright field imaging, which is what I want to show you during this video. The first step is to confirm that the microscope is available and log into the kiosk. So I've already done that um, off the video, just take my word for it. The second step is to turn on the Olympus box, which is item number one. So that is down here. That is the Olympus box. You can see a number one and we just need to turn it on here. It'll make a bunch of noises and some lights will come on. The next step is to turn on the little box, which is item number two. That's underneath the air table, right here. You can see a number two. The next step is to turn on the Retiga camera. The light will turn on. So this is the Retiga camera. This will be used for bright field imaging. There's an on-off button at the top, right there. When you turn it on, you will see the lights come on. We need to configure the camera slider position to middle, right there. The camera slider has a six next to it, it's this item. So we need to take it to the middle. So this is fully in, this is the middle, this is fully out, we need it in that position. We need to check that the polarizer is out, step number six. So the polarizer is this thing here. You move it with this. That is the in position. You can see there's a piece of glass there, which is the polarizer. It's a little bit dusty right now. And that is the out position. So we need things in the out position. Check that the DIC slider is out. So the DIC slider is down here. Get a good view of it. It's this thing here. Let's see if this is a little bit better view. There we go. So it is this slider here. This is the out position. If I pull on this, I take it fully out. So you should not do that actually, but I just want to show you what the component looks like. So this is what the component looks like. You can see there's two grooves there, this one and this one. When we slide it in like this, which it should always be in, it can either be on the first groove or the second. And so 
we want this to be in the out position, which means only the first groove is engaged. So let me see if I can do this here. Uh, let's see, okay, I've inserted it. This would be the in position there. That second click is the out position. So you should be able to feel it when you're actually on the microscope. And there's a set screw right here. So again, that's the in position. That's the out position. This is where it should be, and you can lock it in position with the set screw. Okay. If you, by mistake, take that DIC slider out, here is something that shows you what orientation you need to put it in. So that drawing mimics the shape of the DIC slider, which you can kind of see there. And so that's the orientation in which it goes. So step seven is complete. Step eight, lower objectives by pressing escape key on the microscope. So the focus knob on the left-hand side of the microscope has two buttons, an escape and a toggle between fine and coarse focus. We need to press the escape key and when we do, the objectives will go down. Turn on computer and log in, and then start velocity. So to turn on this computer, I'm gonna click this button, push it down. So while that's starting up, let me show you a few things here on the microscope. As I said before, the escape key allows you to lower the objective, so it's a good idea to have you in the low position uh, before beginning. Uh, if we press escape again, it'll go back up to wherever it was. So we always want it at the bottom uh, when we're putting on samples. And then the fine course, so this other button here that says FC, that button toggles between um, fine or coarse focus. There aren't two knobs like on some other microscopes, there's just one and that toggles it. Unfortunately, uh, for bright field, there's nothing on the microscope that shows you whether you're on fine or coarse, but the microscope starts uh, in fine. The other thing is that uh, Olympus microscopes, as opposed to Zeiss ones, uh, when you turn this focus knob away from you, it lowers the objective. When you turn it towards you, it raises the objective. This is exactly opposite between the Zeiss and the Olympus microscopes. So it's something to keep in mind if you're coming from one of those. The other thing to keep in mind is that this microscope has three places where the light can go once it hits the sample. The eyepieces, this camera, or that camera. To control whether the light goes to this camera or to this section of the microscope, we use this button. Because we will be looking either by eye or with this camera, we always want the light to go to this part of the microscope. So we should always have it in the eyepiece mode. To control whether the light goes to the eyepieces or to the objective or to both, that's what this slider accomplishes. Uh, in the middle position, it'll go to both, which is a proper setting um, if we're doing bright field. Okay, so the computer has started up. You'll see there are two users, Luna and MSL admin. So we're gonna click on Luna. Password is MSL, all lowercase, just the acronym for the lab. And there are various softwares that you can use to drive this microscope. Uh, for Brightfield, I recommend you use Velocity. So let's double click on it here. If you are already a user of the BX61, uh, this use of velocity uh, for bright field imaging is very similar to that on the BX61 with just only minor differences as far as the software goes. I will go over how to use the software anyway, uh, just in case you are not a user of the BX61 and you haven't seen that tutorial video. Uh, but let me go over some of the uh, things specific to the microscope before we get to velocity. So this is an inverted microscope. The objectives are down there pointing up, so we need to place our samples with the cover slip pointing towards the objective, so down. Um, 
we can also move this arm back by tilting it, which will allow us to have more room here. This is the sample holder. This is the stage, which is motorized and can be moved with this joystick here. So you can see how I can move the stage by moving the joystick. And if I press and hold this button, I can move the, the stage more quickly. I can change the objectives by pressing these buttons here. So for example, right now it's on the 10X, I can go to 20, 40, and then there's two other positions for 40, 60, uh, and 100. These are oil objectives, and we don't have them on the microscope always. So if you think you'll need an oil objective, uh, please let us know, uh, because we'll have to put it on it on the microscope or explain how to do that. So a note about objectives here. So there are four air objectives, a 4X, a 10X, a 20X, and a 40X. Um, the 20X and 40X objectives have correction colors on them. Uh, this allows you to use them either to look at cover slip, uh, sort of samples with cover slips on them, or to look at samples in dishes. So how do you adjust them for samples in dishes or cover slips? So if you look at those these very closely, let me see if I can do it from here. Yep, so you will see they have correction colors on them, which is this uh, ring with a groove. And so this can be turned. And depending on the position in which we put this, the, the objective will be optimized either for um, a cover slip or for uh, a multi-well plate. Uh, there is no rule as to how that is set by default, so you should always check that if you're going to use them and make sure you set them to the proper position. So because it's very difficult for me to show you the markings on the objectives from the current camera angle, uh, what I'm going to do is pause the video, remove the objective from the microscope just so you can see how to adjust it. Uh, you'll be able to see that in person when you get in here and just sort of poke your head in there. Um, but it's very hard for me to do that while filming, so I'm gonna remove it to show you clearly how to set the, uh, those objectives uh, if you're imaging cover slips or multi-well plates. All right, so I've just removed the 40X objective. You can see it here. Uh, just so uh, you can see the markings and the correction color a little bit more easily. So you can see that uh, when I turn the correction collar, there are some grooves with numbers that turn relative to another uh, white groove up here. I don't know if you can see it there, I'm pointing at it. So for example, right now, I have the zero position aligned with that groove. This is the 0 0.17 position. This is the 0 0.5 position. And this is the one position and the two positions. So what are all these? So these markings represent the optimal thickness through which the objective is looking. So if you're using cover slips, you should be using number 1.5 cover slips that have a thickness of 0 0.17 millimeters. And so if you're using cover slips, the setting on, these, uh, on this objective should be the 0 0.17. If instead you're using multi-well plates with a plastic bottom, that plastic bottom is typically a millimeter in thickness, so you should be there. Now on the other side of this objective, there is a non-marked groove on the, on the correction collar and then a stationary one on top. Those grooves, when they're aligned, they represent the number one position. So for multi-well plates, as you can see there again. You can see that it's clearly on number one, and if I turn this around, you can see those two lines are aligned. Whereas if I'm on the 0 0.17, which would be for cover slips, those are not aligned. So you need to know uh, how to do this, and you need to check it before you, um, you start your imaging, if you're going to use the 20 or 40X objective. And so the way you check it uh, is by looking through the side on the microscope. So I'll now try and show you what that looks like from the side. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to maneuver my phone into that position, but if I can, I will. And so you'll, you'll be able to, to see kind of how it looks from the side. So right now I'm in a zoomed in view below the microscope stage. I, I will soon zoom out so you can see. 
And there you can see the correction collar. So you would typically adjust this by putting your fingers in here and rotating to the proper position. So that is the proper position for cover slips. And then this would be the proper position for multi-well plates with the um, objective on the microscope stand. So let's say we wanna do cover slips. So that's the proper position for the 40X. Let's see for the 20X. You can see that that one is also set correctly. I'm just gonna adjust it slightly. There we go. So just so you can see where this was taken. We were looking from the side. All right, so that's how you adjust the correction colors on the 20X and 40X. You don't need to do that if you're not gonna use those objectives, but if you do, that's how you do it. So another issue on this microscope is that because it has the capability to do multi-well plate imaging, a lot of people take advantage of that capability. As a result, we can swap this sample holder, which is for um, slides and 35 millimeter dishes, for this sample holder, which is for plates. And if it's not here, sometimes people leave it on this desk or on either side of the microscope here. So the way we swap things, we want to hit the escape key to lower any objectives. So they're already at the bottom. That's what that beeping means. We can just pop this out. Grab this. And you'll see on this microscope, there are some clips there. So if we gently push things into that corner and make sure press them down, we can have a plate in position and then secure the plate with that clasp. So I'm going to do uh, imaging for the purposes of this tutorial video with a slide. So I'm gonna put this one back on. That'll also give you an opportunity to see that again. All right. I'm also gonna start by imaging at 10X. So I've just pressed the button here and put the 10X in position. So now I'm gonna grab a slide and put it on the microscope. So here I have a sagittal section of mouse brain. I believe that's what this is. And I am going to put it with the cover slip side down, which is the, the side that's pointing to the camera right now. on the holder on the microscope. So notice that the slide is inserted into this sort of groove in there on this bottom level. So you don't put it on top of this, you put it on that level down there. Again, let me show you that. You can see the level here. So that's where this gets inserted. to do that one-handed. Once we have the sample in position on the microscope, it's a good idea to move it with the joystick to ensure that the objective is right underneath it. Once we have that, we'll lower this arm. I'll grab it from the top and just lower it. Okay. And at this point, we've done everything we needed to do on the microscope by hand, we need to switch our focus to the software. So whenever Velocity starts, you will see that it asks you whether you want to create a new library or open an existing library. So the library is just what Velocity calls the database of images, uh, where it puts your, your, your images. Uh, and it's best to just create a new one every day you come. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a new library by clicking here. And I'm going to put it in computer data, user data, and if I don't have a folder for myself, I'll put one here. And it's a good idea when you create these folders to please use your first and last name. And then uh, my strategy is always to give um, file names the name of the date on which they were created, which in this case is 2020-07-21. Okay. Then just for the sake of making things a little bit easier to see, I'm gonna maximize this and I'm gonna maximize that. All right, so that's the velocity window. You can see it's covering the entire screen. 
to get the controls in the in the in view, I'm going to click once where it says Video Preview Retiga. So now you see that I have an image. I can't really see much, and then I have controls here for the Retiga camera. And so the first thing I'm going to do is click where it says BF, which stands for Bright Field. When I do that, the microscope makes a bunch of noises and it changes its configuration to bright field imaging. So at this point, what I need to do is go to the eyepieces, look down the microscope, and focus on the cells of interest. So if you recall, we had hit the escape position when we loaded the sample. So again, this button down here that says ESC makes the objective go down. So now what we need to do is raise it by pressing escape again until it's in focus. So if you press on it and it um, makes that beeping noise, that means that you, we accidentally touch this knob. And so if we accidentally touch this knob while we were in the escape position, the microscope won't go up. We'll have to move it up by hand. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna click on course. So I'll click here on this fine or course button, the FC. That switches the microscope to course mode. And on this microscope, again, away from us is down, towards us is up, so I need to go up. So what I'm going to do is focus uh, by eye. I won't be able to show you that. And once I have it in focus, uh, we'll continue the tutorial. So I just tried looking through the eyepiece by eye, and I couldn't see anything at all. It was just completely dark. So you might run into this situation as well. So you need to check a few things uh, to make sure that uh, light is reaching the sample. Um, so one thing is over here, you should see that this, which indicates the light intensity, should be at nine. If it's not, you can press this button here to turn the light on if it were off, and then these buttons to increase or decrease the illumination until it's at this sort of camera level. Uh, so that was fine. Uh, that, that actually wasn't the problem. The problem is that not enough light is reaching the sample. And so um, how do we increase the amount of light reaching the sample? So on this microscope, the bright field illumination comes from here, it goes that way, then it goes down into the sample through the condenser, then through the objective, and then it goes either to the eyepiece or to the camera. So the problem is that as the light moves from the bulb here, this way, and then down into the sample, there are a bunch of filters here. And so these are what are called neutral density filters. Their presence lowers the intensity of the light, and you can simply move them out of the way by um, pulling these up and out. Now the final one you shouldn't remove because that's actually a filter that gives it the proper quality of light um, and that blocks uh, certain wavelengths that you don't want. But these ones just control the intensity of the light. And so if you can't see something through the eyepiece, just make sure you remove all of these to make sure enough light hits the sample. And in fact, you can now see if you look at the sample there's a spot of light hitting it, whereas before there wasn't. And as you can see, if I remove, uh, actually put back all those filters, that spot of light disappears. So there simply wasn't enough light hitting the sample when I move them all out of the way there is. So now I can actually focus by eye, and that's what I'm gonna do uh, after I pause the video. All right, so I've just focused on that sample, which turned out not to be a brain sample. That was uh, completely wrong. It's more likely some chunk of liver just happened to have a shape that looked like the brain. Um, so now it's, it's, it's in focus by eye, which unfortunately I can't show you uh, because I can't um, image through the eyepieces very clearly. So now we have to um, go to velocity uh, so that we can get an image uh, on the screen. And so to do that, you can see right now this is completely white. Um, so that means that it's probably overexposed, and you can confirm that's the case if you look here. So these numbers, the numbers on the right, are the maximum pixel intensity. So these numbers here are the maximum pixel intensity uh, for each of those colors. And you can see they're not changing, and they're at 4095 or 5094, which is the maximum possible on this camera. So this image is completely saturated, meaning the exposure is too long. Uh, so how do we control the exposure and other camera parameters? So the three camera parameters are the offset, the gain, and the exposure, okay? So the offset should always be at zero, the gain should always be at one, and then we need to change the exposure. Now, at the moment, there's so much light hitting the sample because I removed 
all three of the possible filters, that my impression is that the exposure can go down. Right now it's at 60 milliseconds, but it probably won't be able to compensate for the huge amount of light that's hitting the sample. So before I mess with the exposure, let me just put two of those filters in. So now you can see it's much darker. Let's see what happens if we remove their two filters out. So now you can see an image that's a little bit more reasonable. Now it's still saturated. You can see over here that there's saturation, but now the exposure is much closer to what it should be. Let's see if we can focus. Okay. So now, uh, since I'm a little bit closer, what I'm going to do is let's see if I can focus here on the screen. There we go. I'm going to hit this auto expose button here. And what the software is going to do is it's going to try various exposures until it reaches one where there's no saturation. And you can see that this is true because if you look again up here, those numbers are changing and they're below 4,095. Okay, so we have a starting point. Now what we need to do is uh, a procedure to illuminate the sample properly called Kohler illumination. So the way this works is first, we need to have the sample in focus. Um, so we've just done that. Um, the next step is to close what's called the field stop. So that's this aperture here. This is just an iris. I'm going to close it and you'll see the effect on the screen. So you can see that the screen went completely dark. If you look down the eyepieces, what you'll see is that there's a small um, kind of hexagon or octagon in the field of view. So if you look down here, uh, you'll not, you won't be able to see it, but there's a small octagon in the field of view. What we're going to do now is move the height of the condenser by moving this knob here. We're going to turn this so that when we look by eye, the spot that we see in the, um, through the eyepieces gets brighter, sharper, and smaller. So just trust me that I'm going to do that. And so now this is a pretty good representation of what I see in the eyepiece. What we want is for this to be as small as possible and the edges to be as sharp as possible and for it to be as bright as possible. So you can see that if I move it uh, away from this position, if I move it a little bit, it gets dimmer and not as sharp. And the same occurs if I go in the other direction. So if I overshoot in the other direction, but there's a point where it's as sharp as possible. And ideally you want to be able to see a slight magenta edge there on the side. So when we have that, this is not obviously how we want the image to look in the end, but this is uh, to make sure the illumination is properly set up. Uh, we want to uh, center this. So the way we're going to do that is with these two screws. So this one and this one, and we move them at the same time. So the two screws I'm going to use now are these two, and I'm going to use those to center that in the center of the field of view as visualized on the eyepieces. So that's not quite the center on the camera, so I'm going to adjust it so that it's centered on the camera by moving those screws. Let's see if I can get that. Okay, so that's pretty reasonable. Um, now I'm going to open up the field stop. And as I open it up, you'll see that opening up and make sure that it's still centered. So I'm going to use those two lateral screws. Okay, so that's pretty good. And now I'm going to open it so that we don't, 
see any of those edges. Okay, uh, so why did we do this? The reason we did this is this uh, ensures the illumination is nice and uh, as flat as possible, and it gives us the maximal resolution. There's one other adjustment that we can make, which is the condenser aperture, which is this. So if we close this, if we leave it all the way open, the image is bright. If we close it, the image becomes a little bit sharper, but at a certain point you see a lot of artifacts in the image and it gets much dimmer. So how much to close it or open it is a little bit of an art. Um, it won't hurt uh, if, if you don't, you're not sure, you can just keep it all the way open. The other thing you can do is if you remove this eyepiece, um, you can close it until you see the edges occupying kind of two thirds of what you see when you remove this. Uh, I have a presentation on how to do this procedure called Kohler Illumination or Kohler Alignment or Aligning the Bright Field Illumination. Uh, you can take a look at that and uh, it'll walk you through these same steps, but I've shown you the mechanics of how to do this. Now, if you don't do it, uh, your images might look fine or they might look considerably worse because they will be with whatever the settings were that the last person left, which might not be the appropriate ones for your objective. So this Kohler Illumination has to be repeated uh, for every objective. Okay, so now let's go over how to take an image. So to take an image on this microscope, uh, once we've done the Kohler illumination, we can reset the auto exposure just to make sure that the image looks good. So that tweaked it slightly. And just like on the BX61, it's a very good idea to take a blank image without the slide in the field of view. Because as you can see here, there are some imperfections. So the middle looks brighter than the edges. And there's also um, some slight imperfections that don't change when I move the image, which suggests they're in the light path. So to compensate for those, we're going to take a blank image. And so to take a blank image, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna move completely off the slide. So if you can see here, let me see if I can refocus on the slide. You can see it's pointing at the slide. I'm just gonna move the slide so that it's no longer there. So now the, the, the microscope is just looking at nothing. So as you can see here, there's nothing in the field of view and you can see very clearly that the center is brighter than the edges. So we don't want that sort of shading effect in our images. And so as a result, uh, what we want is to take this image, this blank image, and then use it to correct all of our other images. So uh, to do that, we have to, there's a few caveats. First, when we're here, it might be brighter. So we want to auto expose again. You can see the exposure time dropped from 45 to 36 milliseconds. We want to confirm that nothing is saturated because if, if the image is saturated, so if any of these are not moving and they're at the maximum, this, the procedure to correct the images is simply not going to work. And finally, we need to make sure that this actually looks white because that's what it looks like when I look down the eyepieces. And so to do that, we're going to go to video and go to auto white balance. Okay. So that's going to tell the microscope, hey, this is white. Make sure you adjust everything so it looks white. So now that looks white, you can see it adjusted the exposure slightly. And also, it's not saturated. So this is what we want for our blank image. We're going to take this picture and then we're going to use it to correct all of the other pictures that we take, which are gonna be taken with exactly the same conditions as long as we don't change the objective. So to take an image, we are going to click here on this camera icon. Let's see if I can find the mouse, here we go. And you can see that we have the image here. Now it has a really strange long name because that's the name of the last person uh, that the last person gave to whatever it was they were doing. So I'm gonna change it by clicking once and just writing, I'm just gonna call it blank. And I'll call it blank 10X. Okay. Now, if I keep taking images, they will have that uh, weird name. Um, so I, I want to change that. I, I don't want that base name for something that, you know, a sample that someone else was using. So to change the base name that we're going to use, I'm going to click on video preview just once, go to video and go to acquisition setup. In acquisition setup, you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff. All we need to do is change the title. 
So I'm gonna call it sample because I, I'm actually not sure what this is. I suspect it's a liver, but um, I'm not sure. So I'm just gonna call it sample. And as I take images, the software will name them sample, sample one, sample two, sample three, et cetera. So I'm gonna say, okay. But now I'm gonna go back to the actual sample. So that, again, the reason I, I took a blank image is because later that will allow us to correct um, imperfections in the illumination and get a much better image as a result. Okay, so I'm on the sample. So now I'm going to make sure I'm in focus. And I'm gonna snap an image by clicking again. Camera icon. So you can see there's sample. I'm gonna move around. It's to a different area, maybe this edge. I'm gonna take another sample. And let me take one more. Seem to have gotten lost, so when that happens, just take a look here. You can see I'm not on the tissue, but at least I'm not so lost that I'm not on the slide. There we go. Just focus again. And there. So that's as good as any an area for me to take. I'm going to click here. And now you can see I have a blank and three sample images. So now uh, I need to, uh, to, to be able to look at these images, I need to export them. And so the way I export them is I select them all. So just left click them all. And I can either go to File Export, or if I right click here, I can say uh, Export. When we export, we want to be uh, in a separate folder. So this is the library that I created at the beginning of the imaging session today. In here, there's another folder that says data. Uh, this is where the actual raw data is, but we can't do anything with this raw data, so we need to export in another format. We don't want to put any information in here. We don't want to put anything in this special folder or take anything out. See this, how this folder has this purple ball? That means it's like a special folder the velocity made to store data, uh, but we can't do anything, so we need to leave this alone. So we'll just make another folder. I typically call that folder export. And this is where we're gonna put uh, the images in a way that we can actually use them. So to export images from velocity uh, in um, sort of bright field images, you should always save them as TIFF. Don't use JPEGs, don't use OME TIFFs, don't use anything else, only TIFF then you have to go to options, even if you know that whatever's in options is correct because you just did it one minute ago. Every single time you export a file, you need to click on options. You need to click where it says convert to RGB for publication and don't click on scale or time. You have to do this every time. If you don't, the files will come out with a, with a different format. Even if you, know, you go in and you don't need to change anything, you still need to hit okay. Finally, we're gonna go to naming. And so here's how we can name the item. So right now the items are being named with a numerical subscript. Uh, that's not what I want uh, in this case. I want the, the, the images to be named just with the item name. So I want the name of the files to be whatever is here. If you want something else, you can adjust these settings. So we're gonna say okay. And then we're gonna say export. So now if I go to the folder where those images live, user data, you can see that here they are. And if I double click on them, the Windows just photo viewer will open them. Now these uh, images, you can see actually very clearly that they have some shading on the, on the edges. Hopefully you can see that, particularly here, it's, it's very noticeable because this is all white. So how do we fix that? So the way we fix that is by using uh, a plugin in Fiji. And so there's a separate video that shows you how to do that. Uh, and I encourage you uh, to check out that video and to always take a blank image and adjust them because that's going to make your images uh, much, much better. So again, there's a video and I'll link to it from this one that shows you how to uh, 
do the flat fielding or the correction or the shading correction of these images so they'll look a little bit better. So uh, what we should uh, do now is, um, this is pretty much it uh, as far as how to take images with the bright field on the system. It's quite simple. Uh, so let me show you uh, what the shutdown procedure looks like. So the shutdown procedure is on the other side of the startup procedure. So there are a lot of steps here. Um, you only need to do one, the ones that apply to you. So the first step is to clean the oil objectives and remove and store them if you. So we didn't use any oil objectives, so we don't need to do that. Second step, lower objectives by pressing escape key on the microscope. So the escape key again is here. Let's press that. That just lowers the objectives. So now they're farther away from the sample. So I'm going to remove the sample while we're at it. Put it there. Next step is to export images, connect to the server, save files to the folder, disconnect from the server. So I already exported the images. I actually don't want to save these on the server, but for you, if you do want to, there are instructions for how to do that here. So just follow them. They're on the bottom left-hand side of the monitor if you want to remove your data. Uh, and put it on the server. Exit velocity or metamorph. So metamorph is a different software that's used for fluorescence imaging on the scope. We were using velocity, so I'll exit velocity, which I can do just by clicking up here. Yep. The next step is to turn off the Retiga camera if applicable. It says if applicable because even if someone else had been using it for fluorescence, but the camera were still on, they would need to turn it off. So. Uh, it's definitely applicable to us. We turn this camera on, so let's turn it off. If you remember, this is the Retiga camera. This is the on-off button. I'm gonna turn it off. Check that the polarizer is out, pulled to the left. So if you recall, this is the polarizer right here. That's in, that's out. We're supposed to leave it in the out position. Seven, check that the DIC slider is out. So the DIC slider, again, is this hard to uh, film thing here. And since I didn't move it and I had left it in the out position, this, uh, this item here is in the out position still. Step eight, check that the ND filter slider is in the empty position or pulled right. So the ND filter slider, something at the back of the microscope here. Let's see if I can show it to you. So it's this slider here. And this is supposed to be pulled all the way to the right. So you can see it should be pulled here. It has several positions, which are here, 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 and here. And so we want it uh, in the, in sort of pulled all the way to the right. This is also explained here. And it shows you what position of that filter should be. So if, again, I'm gonna try and show you again, this slider here, has multiple sort of holes and filters, uh, it needs to be all the way this way. It didn't affect us uh, during bright field imaging, uh, so that's why when I started the system up, I didn't do anything about that, but we're supposed to leave it in a neutral position for the next person which might be doing fluorescence, and that position means just pulling that all the way to the right. Turn off CO2 if applicable. So this is the CO2 tank. This is only for people that do live imaging. But if you see that these gauges are um, not at zero, just turn it off by rotating it clockwise. Check the calendar. Is anyone booked within the next two hours? If the answer is yes, you log out of the iLab kiosk if you're, and you're done. If the answer is no, you continue with the checklist. So then you do all of these that are applicable. Shut down the computer. Turn off the LED, that's item number five. Um, so if this item is on, which it's not right now, 
If it's on, it will have this symbol. If it's off, it'll have just a line, and you toggle between them by pressing this. So if you see that it's on, just turn it off by pressing there, and you'll see a change in this LED display window. Turn off the Hamamatsu camera, that's item number four. So this is the Hamamatsu camera. If it were on, we would see this light on, and then here's the on-off button right there. So if you see that it's on, you need to turn it off. Again, why would this be on if we hadn't turned it on? Well, maybe someone before us had been using the system in a different mode, and so then they might have uh, left it on because they saw that someone was after them. We don't have an easy way on the microscope calendar to show what people are using on the microscope, so a number of things might have been left on that you are responsible for turning off. Turn off the Excite Silas, that's item number three. So that's this one, and uh, you can barely see, it's a little bit faded, I need to reinforce that with marker, but the on-off button is here. Turn off the Loodle Box, that's number two. This is something that we did turn on. And turn off the Olympus box, that's number one. Cover the microscope stand, I'll do that in a moment, and then log out of the kiosk. So that's it, that's how you take uh, simple bright field images on the iX81. I hope that you found this useful. I will have other videos on how to take uh, bright field tiling on this system, uh, as well as how to do fluorescence uh, and um, fluorescence stacks for wide field deconvolution. Uh, and there'll be uh, links to it inside the iX81 playlist. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, just email me and uh, I'll be happy to talk to you.